everyone welcome to technical sciences paper one examination preparation presented by miss Laba. without wasting any time let's check our scope for this paper we have paper one which consists of mechanics electricity and magnetism and waves and sound so our first topic is introduction to mechanics whereby we are going to take a look at two different graphs so what do we need to know about our graphs let me just do select my pen so we need to know that our graph is supposed to have a title very important your graph must have a title depending on what are we investigating number two we need to identify our variables so remember we have two types of variables dependent and independent so where do we get our independent variable we get our independent variable from the x-axis independent variable so graph one graph two you have your independent variable on the x-axis then what about our y-axis our y-axis we are going to have dependent variable so we know that we must have a title then we must have the two different variables what is the difference between these two graphs the first graph when y y increases when y increases x sorry i think I might have covered my pen just too far. Right. So we are saying x will do what will increase as well. So what do we mean? We mean that the relationship between your x and your y is going to be a direct proportion. Relationship. What is direct proportion when x increases, y also increases? Then let's take a look at graph number two. For graph number two, when y decrease, x will increase. Or we can say when y increase, X will do what will de X will decrease. Right. Now we know the difference between the two graphs. We know that for graph number one, it's an increase, increase. For graph number two, it's a decrease and increase. You need to be able to calculate or to determine the equation for the graphs so for graph number one our equation will be given by y is equals to mx plus c where y is our y intercepts m it's the gradient x is the x axis and then c it's where your y intercepts cuts and then this one will be given by y times x is equals to k i'm going to take a look at an example to explain right the table shows results from an experiment that was done by grade 11 technical science learners to investigate the speed of sound so what are we investigating we are investigating the speed of sound we have two variables as i said so the first variable that's given here it's time then we also have distance before we can even read the question we must be able to see what type of graph from 0 to 1 from 1 to 2 2 to 4 4 to 6 it's an increase it was 0 then it was 10 then it was 20 40 60 it's also an increase so we agree that when time increase distance also increases so we know that this is going to be our directly proportional type of graph so it says use the graph paper attached to draw an accurate graph of these results with an appropriate scale right 
Und hier ist ein Mädel lang. So, aber Grafen ist deine Dosierung. One, two, three, four, five, six, ten, twenty, thirty, forty, fifty, and then sixty. Remember, we said we must be able to determine our title. So what are we dealing with? We are dealing with time and distance. Therefore, our title will be time versus distance. Right. And then we said we must be able to determine our variables. Remember, x axis is your independent. So how do you know you're independent? Whenever you have a table, your first column will always be your x axis. Or your depend independent variable apologies so here we are going to write time it's very important to include the si unit and then when i don't have enough space i'll just start here we are going to write distance m and it's going to be zero is zero one and ten two and twenty we don't have three Four and forty, and then six. Oh shame! I finished my space there. It's not really accurate because I did not use a graph paper. But what can we tell? We did do our title. We connected our line. It started at zero. We have our axis. We also have the y axis. Then the next question says you must identify the variables. We already know that this is our dependent and then this is our independent. So we're going to say dependent variable its distance. Then independent variable is going to be time. So we must include the units. Calculate the gradient of the graph. The gradient will be given by m is equals to y2 minus y1 all over x2 minus dx1. I take 20 and 10. So then it's going to be 2 and 1. It's going to be 10 over 1, which is the same as 10. Because we are dealing with distance and time, your unit will be meter for distance and then time seconds determine the equation of the graph we already know that it has an increasing on both sides type of graph so it's going to be y is equals to m x plus c we already determined our m which is 10 x plus let's check where is our graph cutting on the y intercept it's cutting at zero therefore it's the c is going to be zero and then our graph is 10x and then it's equals to 10x so very important you must know your variables your first column is your x-axis or we can say your independent variable you must be able to have a title you must be able to calculate your gradient and determine the equation for the graph Moving on to the next topic, it's mechanics, whereby we are going to take a look at a vector quantity. So what is a vector quantity? A vector quantity is a physical quantity with both magnitude and direction. Very important to know that your vector quantity always has magnitude and direction. So I made an example of two boys. One boy is pulling and the other boy is pushing. So can you see direction? Yes, we do see direction. They are pushing in this direction. And then what about magnitude for those that forgot what is magnitude? It is the size that is applied for this box to be able to do what to move. So in terms of magnitude, I did not give you any magnitude. But you would know that because it's force, it's supposed to be newtons. I'll just say this is 70 newtons and this is 65 
So we have both magnitude and direction here. So what is our magnitude? 70 and 65. And then what is our direction? That's where we are going to look at. We have two types of direction. We have compass direction. Compass direction. What is compass direction? So whether you are checking the direction. So they are pulling in this direction. So this direction will be west if it was going upwards we were going to say our compass direction is north east and then south very simple in terms of compass direction then we are going to take a look at bearing so what is bearing it is whereby we use angles 0 90 180 and 270 but we all know this so what is the direction of these two forces we are going to say it's 270 if we use bearing direction um, we'll take a look at more examples as we move on right so we have two types of vectors we have collinear vectors and core planar vectors so what is a collinear vector are vectors that are along the same line that's why we call them core linear because they are along the same line and then we have core planar vectors vectors that are in the same plane so the previous example it's a collinear vectors because they are on the same line it was a push on this direction and also a pull on this direction we did not have a vector that is a core planar so as you can see that I already wrote for us resultant vector. So what is a resultant vector? It's when you have a single vector, a single vector that has the same effect as two or more vectors right let me change the color so that i can represent a resultant vector for our collinear vectors remember the examiner will give you a scale so we said it must be a single there it is it's single that has the same effect. What is the same effect in terms of direction? It's going in the same direction as two or more vectors, also the magnitude. So this is our resultant vector. But what about vectors on the same plane? Right. Vectors on the same plane. It means that we are going to start introducing an angle. So let's start with the first example. Let's say instead of the two boys pushing and pulling in the same direction, one pulls in this direction and then the, one, the other one pulls upwards. So we'll have our 70 newtons. It looks like a 20. It's honestly a 70. And then the other one I said it was 65 newtons. So as we can see here, mathematically, we know that this is going to be 90 degrees. When we have 90 degrees, we can represent our resultant vector from the head of the first vector to the second vector. So let's just say this is F3. So if you are calculating vectors on the same plane, we use theorem of Pythagoras. You're going to say F3 squared, very important, is equals to F70 squared plus F65 squared, which is going to be 70 squared plus 65 squared. I'll get you an answer just now. Right, I calculated my answer. Let me square them so we can remove the two F3 apologies. 
the answer is going to be 95.52 millimeters. So where am I going with this? For us to determine the resultant, we will just combine the two because they are going in the same direction. And then for us to determine the magnitude and direction of F3, we need to use theorem of Pythagoras because it is a right angled triangle. Moving on, I just want to move this up a bit. Move up. Let me just select my red pen again. So we are saying that this force is going to be 95,5 newtons. Remember what do we call this force? This is our resultant force or resultant vector. Let's take a look at a few questions. We are saying which one of the following physical quantities is a vector quantity? Remember, how do we know that something is a vector quantity? It must have both magnitude and direction. So time does not have direction. Speed does not have direction. Mass does not have direction. So our answer here is going to be B. Consider the following vector that makes an angle of 50 de 53 degrees with north. Which one of the following represents the direction of this vector? Going back to directions. We are saying that the angle is from north. 53 where is it going it's going to east so how do we represent remember it must be north what is the angle 53 where to east it is not east 53 north it is north 53 degrees of east so the correct answer is c this okay right it says a b in the diagram below is a vector with a direction of 60 degrees west of south the direction of vector a can be written as a bearing of, remember what did we say about bearing? This is 0, 90 degrees, 180 degrees, 270 degrees, right? So from here, 0, 90, 180, what is 180 plus 1, uh, what is 180 plus 60 is going to be 240. So the bearing for this vector will be 240 but if it was asking about the compass direction your compass direction would be 60 west of that can be written as s 60 degrees of west i almost wrote east then the second one says Vector f, x, and f, y are components of vectors as shown in the diagram below. Right, I did not introduce this part on our previous slide. The law, there's a law that says if, if from this point S1, we can present two forces by both magnitude and direction along the diagonal sides of these forces the force from this point is known as the resultant vector so what do we mean we mean that when you have f1 and f2 at an angle and you can represent the force from the diagonal point of these two forces. We are talking about the parallelogram law. So it's asking which of the following statement is correct. When you have the parallelogram law, you have Fy. You also have Fx, which is always given by F. C. 
sine theta. And then this is always given by f cos theta. Fy being this, fx being your horizontal. F being your resultant. Then the angle, very important, the angle is always the angle from your x-axis to your resultant. So we are looking for uh, this angle. So if this is 20, what is 90 minus 20? It means here it's going to be 70 degrees. Apologies, it can't be 70 degrees if it's not a right angle. So it means because they are saying it fifth, it's 50, meaning this angle is 50, not 70. So this will be 50 degrees. So which statement is correct regarding this diagram? They are saying the first one, A, F is equals to Fx minus fy it can be correct then the second one says f x is equals to f cos 20 degrees we are not using the 20 degrees angle because it is not from the x axis then number c says fy is equals to f sine 50 and the last one says fx is equals to f sine 50 this is incorrect because your horizontal component is not calculated by sine, but it's calculated by cos. So the correct answer is C. Why is it correct? Because the angle that is used, it is the angle from the x-axis. Alright, try and be as quick as possible. Time is not on my side. Two forces acting at a point. The angle between them is 35. So the angle between FA and FB is 35. Choose a suitable scale and determine the magnitude and the resultant force using the parallelogram law. I am not going to do this up to scale, but I'm just going to explain the parallel explain sorry explain the parallelogram law. So you already know that the angle here it's 35. What are we looking for? We are looking for the resultant. Remember, we said parallelogram, if you can present these two along its diagonal sides, so you're going to start representing the diagonal sides, which is your components. So we are constructing our vertical and horizontal component. There we go. So we are looking for this force. So you will use your ruler to determine your force in centimeter and or millimeters, then change it to your newtons using a suitable scale. Then how do you determine the direction? Do you start from zero degrees, which is your bearing, to your force? So that's 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70. So the angle here, we can say it's 70 degrees remember i did not do it to scale but i just wanted to let you know that you must construct your diagonal sides then from the point you must draw your resultant vector then determine the direction using bearing method and then it says write down the magnitude of the angle of the resultant force which with respect to the positive x axis so the angle is the one that i said it's going to be 70 degrees the next one the diagram below presents two vectors that are acting on an object not to scale define the term resultant vector remember what is resultant vector a single vector that has the same effect as two or more component vectors i already wrote down a resultant vector on the previous slide as i said time is not on my side right what is the difference between collinear vector and core planner remember collinear they are on the same line so 
plana in this way then co plana get us on the same plane use the diagram to calculate the following f3 that's where you are going to use your f1 is equals to squared plus f3 squared then you will substitute to determine f3 so as i calculated my f3 is 67,08 meters and then they say we must determine the angle how do we determine the angle remember we know that here it's 90 from our 90 we already have 16 so our angle will be is equals to 90 degrees minus 16 sorry comma 6 which will be given by 73,5 degrees. Then you must determine the vertical component F1 and the horizontal component F1. Right, so the 4.3.3, what are we calculating? We are calculating the vertical component. So what is the vertical component? Vertical component is f y f y is given by f sine theta remember i said theta it is the angle from your x axis to your f so what is our force one is 70 sine which angle are we using we are using 73 comma which is 67 comma 08 it's force so therefore the unit is newtons then for horizontal component we are going to say f x is equals to f cos theta what is our force 70 cos what is our angle from x axis that is 73 4 which is going to be 20 newtons right and then if you are unable to move this box remember we've been talking about pushing and pulling so if you are unable to push or pull a box it means there is a force that is resisting the movement of the box whereby we call it what a frictional force so we have two types of frictional force first we have kinetic friction and we have static friction so we said by friction it means that it is a force opposing it opposes the the motion of an object the motion of an object in opposite direction very important in opposite direction so we are talking about static friction and then we are also talking about kinetic friction let's start with static friction it means that the object is not moving it is stationary so what are the factors that affect this object from moving firstly it's going to be our normal force and our surface so what do we mean it means we must start introducing our equation whereby because we are saying it's static it is not moving we are going to say fs for static coefficient of the kinetic friction no 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 apologies we are talking about the static friction we 
there you go so we are saying the static kinetic coefficient times our normal force then what about here we are going to say once it starts moving but on a rough surface we still have normal force and we still have the surface so it will be given by what f kinetic because it's now moving by the coefficient of the kinetic friction times the normal force so what is it that you need to know for this topic or you need to remember you need to remember that you are working with your normal force and your surface and how do we calculate normal force normal force is given by w is equals to m times g so if you were given the mass of the box you will determine the normal force by using this formula and then the surface it's whereby you get your coefficient to determine the friction so let's look at different questions so the first question says the same box i took it from a previous paper so it says the same box is placed on another horizontal surface so there is we do have a surface pulled with a force of 40 newtons which makes a, an angle of 30 degrees with a horizontal as shown the box is moving due to the force of 40 newtons what type of frictional force that the floor exerts on the box while the box is moving remember we spoke about static friction and kinetic friction so is this box moving or not moving it is moving therefore what type of force is this it will be our kinetic it will be our kinetic friction Calculate the magnitude of the frictional force in question 4.4.1 if the coefficient of friction for the two surfaces in contact is 0, 0,02. So how do we calculate the magnitude of frictional force for kinetic friction? We know that we calculate using F K is equals to the coefficient of the kinetic times the normal. What is it that we have? Do we have the normal? Do we have the FK? Do we have UK? We are given 0, 0,2, which is our coefficient. So first we are going to say W is equals to FY plus N, whereby W is M times G, Y M times G, because we are given 10 kg. We cannot use 10 kg. We are talking about weight, therefore it must be a force. Then Fy, why are we introducing Fy? Because it is at an angle of 30 degrees. Then plus our normal. So I will say Fy plus our normal. Then what is our mass? 10 times 9,8. And then we are going to say F sine 30 plus N. What is the total here? N is going to be given by, I'm jumping to the final answer, 78 newtons. Therefore, we can come back here and say, 0, 0,2 times 78, which will be 15,6 newtons. Calculate the magnitude of the horizontal component of the applied force. So we are looking for which component now? We are looking for the horizontal component, which is given by F x is equals to f cos theta what is our force our force is 40 cos what is our angle from the x-axis our angle from the x-axis is 30 
then so we are going to have 34 comma 6 4 meters and what happens to the magnitude of the horizontal component if the angle changes from 30 to 20 explain your answer in words by referring to the angle and the relevant uh, trigonometric relationship so what are they asking and they are asking about the magnitude of the horizontal component which is fx if this angle changes from 30 to 20 so what will happen why should i write it i think i should write it here it's going to increase number one why is it increasing when we decrease the angle when we decrease the angle the horizontal component will increase so what is the lesson here you must know when you calculate the magnitude of the frictional force you must have your normal force which was not given because we were given 10 kg and this was on an angle you must be able to determine your horizontal then also you must know when you calculate your vertical and horizontal component you always use you always use the angle from the x axis right for our next topic we are going to look at magnetism so magnetism you're always going to talk about a magnet which will always have your north pole and south pole so within your magnet if you are able to have a region in space where another ferro magnetic material or magnet will experience a force of attraction we say that we have a magnetic field so what is a magnetic field it's a region in space where another magnet or a ferromagnetic material will experience a force of attraction or repulsion what is force of attraction is when you have your unlike poles and then force of repulsion is when you have like poles so we have north and north and so when you have south and south then your unlike poles will always be north and south right we also mentioned ferromagnetic material ferromagnetic material so what are ferromagnetic materials Oops, let me change the color for ferromagnetic material Oops, let me choose this one so we want to know what is this word It's materials that are materials that are attracted by magnet. Easily, easily or let me add and easily magnetized so what are these materials if i just make an arrow you can remember them by saying s l and c steel is your ferromagnetic material Iron 
is your ferromagnetic material neutral and the last one be cobalt right so what are we saying we are saying that these materials your steel iron nickel and cobalt are your ferromagnetic materials what do we mean we mean that they can be attracted by magnets and they can easily be magnetized and then in terms of the properties of this magnetic field they must never cross they must be continuous they must point from north to south very important if it's north the arrow is moving out if it's south the arrow it's moving in and then you must know that in a magnet your field is strongest at the poles define the term ferromagnetic material in words like we said there are materials that can be attracted by magnets can be attracted by magnets and then they can also be easily magnetized write down the name of two magnetic magnetic sorry materials i said you can remember by saying zinc which is steel iron what do i do now magnet is placed on a table with the north pole pointing on to the left give two properties of magnetic materials sorry give two properties of magnetic field lines remember we said they must never cross they are continuous they point from north to south and they are closest together at poles where the field is strongest so these are your properties of magnetic field read all the magnet in your answer book and draw the magnetic field around this bar magnet what is it that is important for you to remember is to remember that let me just quickly it's north it's south not touch are we done we are not done we need to show the direction what did we say about north it's towards it's not towards very good and we are going to is against me then we are going to do electrostatic for electrostatics it's very important for you to know coulomb's law what is coulomb's law we say that the magnitude of electrostatic force exerted by one point of charge on another point of charge is directly proportional to the product of the magnitudes of the charges and inversely proportional to the square distance between them what do we mean? We mean when you have two spheres, the charges are directly proportional, but the distance, the square distance between them is inversely proportional to the force. 
It means when you increase the charges, the force will also increase. But when you increase the distance, force will decrease. What do we mean? If you are having two spheres and you bring them closer together, by bringing them closer, it means you are decreasing the distance. And what will happen to the force? The force will increase. I hope I'm making sense. And then we say that when we have a regime in space where a charge is experienced, we say that we have an electrostatic force. That can be said to be an electric field hitting around the point of charge. So if you're having spheres and then you experience a force of attraction or repulsion, you have an electric field. Also, if you have parallel plates and you're experiencing, we say that you have electric field. So what do we mean? That can mean that if you have electric field, can be given by F over Q. Why Q? Because we are dealing with spheres. Therefore, we are talking about charge, which can be given by coulombs, which can be given by newtons. Then if you have parallel plates, which the distance between these electric fields must always be equal, the equation will be given by E is equals to V over D. And then moving very fast, um, the electric field pattern for two spheres, X and Y, is shown. Which one of the following statement is correct between X and Y? What can we tell? We can see that the arrows are moving away from x they are also moving away from y so it means they are both positively charged then we must be able to define the term electric field we already defined it previously a region in space where a charge experience an electrostatic Force. Draw the resultant electric field pattern around P, between P and Q. So we go back. Apologies. P is positive, Q is negative. Therefore, this is going to be your answer. Because the other one is positive, the other one is negative must know that if it's positive the arrows move away and then if it's negative the, the arrows enter calculate the magnitude of the electro the electric field at p we have minus 4 times 10 to the power of negative 9 we also have plus 2 times 10 to the power of negative 9 sometimes it can be given by 2 n coulombs n being nano coulombs sometimes it can be given by two times macro coulombs macro being negative six so what are we calculating we are calculating the electric field of p at q so electric field is given by f over q what is our F? Our F is going to be seven comma two times ten to the power of negative four divided by what are we calculating? We are calculating the electric field at Q. So what is the electric field at Q? It's four to the power of negative 9 which will be given by 1 comma 8 times 10 to the power of 5 remember force in Newton 
in charge in quotes and then 6.234 calculate the distance remember coulomb's law f is equals to k q1 q2 all over r squared k it's a constant so what is our f f is 7.2 Space here. There we go. Seven comma three times ten to the power of minus four. So what is our constant? Remember, I said you get it at the bottom of the information sheet. Times ten to the power of nine. Q one four times ten to the power of negative 9 remember you must check clearly if it's nano coulombs or macro coulombs times 10 to the power of negative 9 so here you were given macro not macro nano coulombs r squared you are looking for r squared you will cross multiply then r squared will be equals to I said I'm moving fast. I'm just gonna give the final answer. And it's no longer on my side. Therefore, R. Remember, you must cross multiply then solve for R. For you to remove the square root, the squared, you must put the square root. F is going to be zero comma. 0, 1 meter y meter because it is distance and then moving on to waves you must know the two types of waves transverse wave succession of succession of transverse pulses then longitudinal wave succession of longitudinal pulses for this topic you must be able to know your points the upper point is called a crest, the lower point is called a trough, and then from your position to your trough, you must know that you have amplitude, even if it's from this position to your crest, it's still called an amplitude. Then the distance between two points that are in phase, two points in phase, we call it the wave length so what is the difference between these two waves the difference is that here the direction of the medium is going up and down then the propagation of the wave is going back and forth but here direction of the medium and propagation of the wave they are moving on the same direction so we are saying to and from also here it's to and from so it's same direction the other one it's up and down to and from so what's important for you to know for this topic remember you must be able to position where's your crest amplitude wavelength also you must be able to calculate your period which is given by t is equals to 1 over frequency your frequency which is given by f is equals to 1 over t and then you must also know the difference between your time and period so period is the period you take to complete one wave that is the period and then the time let me change the color the time is the time for you to complete how many waves one two so period for one wave time for two complete waves because you have two complete waves so you must know that your time is always in seconds also your period it's in seconds then your frequency it's in hertz 
like the meat also we blend it's a blend that's what's going to be in meters so you must know the difference between the two types of waves and then also remember example of a longitudinal wave you can have sound wave as an example because the longitudinal wave the particles vibrate in the same direction we have five minutes left so study the diagram below of a transverse wave and answer the questions that follow so it says label part A to F. Like I said, you must know the labels of your waves. So here's your labels. A being amplitude, curve, crest end, wavelength. And then you need to determine or write down the letter that, that represents points that are in phase and out of phase. So the ones that are in phase, we are saying it's B and G or C and H. And then 3.2.2, we are writing all the letters that are out of phase. Then number four, calculate the period. If your frequency is 50 hertz, remember, period is given by T is equals to 1 over F. Our F is 50, therefore the answer will be 0, 0,02 seconds. Then frequency. Then frequency will be given. This is a mistake. It's supposed to be T. Frequency will be given by F is equals to 1 over T, which is 0, 0,05. The frequency will be 2 hertz. Then calculate the speed. Speed is given by V is equals to F lambda. What is our F? They given as 3,5. And then what is our wavelength in meters? 0,7 remember if it's not in meters you need to convert to meters and then the answer would be 2,45 meters per second then next slide then question 6 we are talking about a sound wave remember on the previous slide I told you that a sound wave it's which type of wave it's a longitudinal wave. So firstly, they want you to define echo. So echo is the reflection of a sound wave. So what type of wave is this one? Remember, we said it's a longitudinal wave. Uh, identify the diagram that will be obtained for. Am I moving right? No, I'm not. I think the questions I have 6.4, 6.4, yeah, I'm starting here. Okay. So, identify the diagram that has soft sound, which will be diagram 3. Why? Because it has a lower amplitude. And then, high pitch. Remember, the first one is asking about soft sound. The second one is asking about high pitch. High pitch will be given by diagram 2 because it has higher frequency. Name the two uses of ultrasounds in technology. So you must know your uses of ultrasounds in technology. You can choose from these uh, uses of ultrasounds. I'm literally left with a few seconds. Ohm's law. Last question. Ohm's law. You must be able to determine it or to give in words. Ohm's law. And then I'm going to move to these questions. When only switch S1. Where's S1? Here it is. It's closed. I'll just close it. The current in ammeter is 0, 0,9A. Calculate the resistance of X. Remember, when this is closed, it's going to move like this. Okay. 
here and then switch as one is closed calculate resistance x so we are going to say r is equals to v over i then we have 10 sorry we have 9 over 0 comma 9 where do we get the 9 from it's 9 volts and then where do we get the 0, 9 from? 0, 9 from that is our current therefore we're gonna have 10 then if you have 10 you can calculate the resistor x then the next question says you must calculate the potential difference v1 across the three ohm resistor so here's our three ohm resistor so they are saying v1 is equals to i r remember if this switch is closed it makes this a series circuit for series circuit current is the same same current because it's series therefore we're going to say 0 comma 9 times 3 which will be given by 2 comma 7 volts calculate the equivalent resistance of the parallel combination when switch s2 is closed as well so now it means the current will go this direction and will also come this direction so because it's a parallel circuit we do know that it's 1 over rp is equals to 1 over r1 plus 1 over r2 1 over rp is equals to 1 over 3 3 ohm resistor and the 6 ohm resistor remember after calculating we are not looking for 1 over rp but we are looking for rp then the total resistance of the circuit r total is going to be your r parallel plus your r series so 2 plus 7 is going to be your 9 ohm resistor Calculate the total current in the circuit using Ohm's law. We have 9 V and 9 Ohms, which will be given by 1 Ampere. What is the reading on V1? Is the reading on v1 when we talk about the reading on v1 it means we are looking for the potential difference across the 6 ohm and the 3 ohm resistor therefore you have two options you can either say um, v1 is equals to i r parallel which i is 1 times 2 which will be given by 2 volts And the last question says you must calculate the current in the 6 ohm resistor. To calculate current, we are saying V is equals to I R. What is our voltage that we just calculated? Remember, because they are parallel, the V1 for 3 ohm resistor will be the same as the V for 6 ohm resistor, which is 2. Then we are looking for I. Then what is our resistor? 6. Therefore, I is going to be equals to 0, 0,33 ohm. That's about it. Please do not forget. Every time you answer, you must have your formula, your answer, 